once again, it's time for... Oh, wait a minute, I forgot. What is it time for? Oh, yeah, it is. Look at that. I remember now. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, sometimes I'm... Sometimes I'm totally convinced that I am basically a dirty slob. No? Oh, how nice. What a nice thing for you to say. <laughs> Bring it up there. <laughs> what do you mean? No, I sit in here and I... Come on now, what are you talking about? Oh, wait a minute. Don't be so quick to say that. You haven't heard the show yet tonight. <laughs> Can you hear me? It's okay now, huh? Hello. One, two, three, four. George, you know you were right. I don't have any matches. How do you like that, see? No, no, I do have some around here. I don't know what I did with them. No, I'm not... Uh, I don't want to smoke. I want to set fire to this crummy studio. Here. <laughs> Thank you, honey. She just threw them four and a half feet in front of me. It's all right. I'll get up and get them. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> Some people are very bright. All right, now, um, <laughs> you slob. All right, let's get this thing right here now. Uh, right, word of warning. I, I, I'm just going to have to put a disclaimer on this uh, before we get this fiasco started tonight. And uh, for the you tonight, I would suggest that you leave quietly and don't disturb the rest of us. Now, I'm just telling you this before we get started. I'm just being very frank and honest. I don't want anybody here, Bert Parks. I don't think that I've got a nice, pure, scrubbed soul like Johnny Carson. Oh, no. Uh, by the way, that's the dirtiest program on the air. It, it really seriously is. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he knows where the body lies. All right. You can take that any way you want. Now, uh, seriously, though, friends, uh, I don't want anyone here thinking that uh, that you're going to get something that you're not going to get because tonight this is, uh, we're going to deal with a difficult subject, one that's not often dealt with on the radio or in the mass media of any type. It's just not often spoken about. And uh, would you please bring me a little romantic music, first of all, Larry? I'm just giving them a warning now. You can go down, get, get on the band there, get... get a couple of notches down the dial, somebody's playing selections from The Sound of Music or maybe selections from a John Gambling memorial album, something, you know, really in. And uh, you might find the situation a little more felicitous as a person of good taste. Bring it up there. Leave the rest of us here. The spit and scratch and snort and the rest of us. All right. The rotten people of the world, you know, the ones who make it so difficult in parking lots and stuff. I'm about to read to you a little piece of poetry that appeared in an American newspaper probably 7,000 years ago or more. Uh, you ready out there, crowd? Okay. This is called Archie Declares War. I am going to start a revolution. I saw a kitchen, a kitchen worker, killing water bugs with poison. Hunting pretty little roaches down to death. It set my blood to boiling. 
I thought of all the massacres and slaughter of persecuted insects at the hands of cruel humans. And I cried aloud to heaven, and I knelt on all six legs, and I vowed a vow of vengeance. I shall organize the insects. I shall drill them. I shall lead them. I shall fling a billion times a billion billion risen insects in an army at the throats of all you humans unless you sign the papers for a damn sight better treatment. Volunteers! Volunteers! Hearken to my calling! Fifty million cry... Fifty million flies are wanted May the 1st to die in marmalade. Curses. Curses. Curses, I say, on the cruel human race. Does not the poor mosquito love her little offspring that you swat against the wall? Out of equatorial swamps and fever jungles come, oh mosquitoes, a billion, billion, billion strong and sting a billion bald heads until they butt against each other and break like eggshells. Caterpillars, locusts, grasshoppers, gnats, vampire moths, black-legged spiders with red hearts of hell, centipedes and scorpions, little gingery ants. Come, come, come. Come, you tarantulas with fury in your feet. Bloodsuckers, wriggle out of the bayous, ticks, cooties, hornets. Give up your little pleasures while your little trivial Sunday school picnics. This is war. Yes, war in earnest. And red revolution come in a cloud with a sun hiding miracle of small deadly wings. Swarm, stab, and bite. What we want is justice. Curses. Curses, curses over land, air, and water. Whirl in a million sweeping and swaying cyclonic dances. Whirl high and swoop down on the cities like a comet bearing death in the loop and flick of its tail. Little, little creatures. Out of all of your billions, make great dragons that lie along the sky and war with the sunset and eat up the moon. Draw all the poison from the evil stars and spit it on the earth. Remember, every planet pivots on an atom, and so you are strong. I swear by the great horned toad of Mithridates. I swear by the vision of whiskered old Pythagoras that I am very angry. I am mad as hell, for I have seen a soapy kitchen mechanic murdering my brothers, slaying little cockroaches, pathetic in their innocence. Damn her red elbows. Damn her spotted apron. Damn her steamy hair. Damn her dull eyes that look like a pair of little pickled onions. Curses. 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 Yes, curses. I even heard her praised for undertaking murder on her own volition. And called the only perfect cook in the city. Come. 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 Come in your billions. Tiny small feet and humming little wings, crawlers and creepers, wrigglers and stingers, scratchers, borers, slitherers, little forked tongues. Man is at your mercy. One sudden gesture, and all of his empires perish. Rise. Strike for freedom. Curses on the species that invented roach poison. Curses. Yes, curses on the stingy beings that evolved tight zinc covers that you can't crawl under, for their garbage cans come like a sandstorm spewed from the mouth of a great apocalyptic desert, making hell, yes, making hell, come like the spray, sooty and fiery, snorted from the nostrils of a sky-eating ogre. Let us have a little direct action, is the sincere wish of Archie, the cockroach. <laughs> now, that's it. Keep that. We may just need that. Now the truth is out. The truth is out. Have you seen? Now, isn't that one of the clearest delineations of perspective? It all depends on the angle at which you view a problem as to whether a thing is good or evil. And tonight's... Oh, boy, I'll tell you. you know, I, like that, I, like that, I like that one line. I saw tonight a, a 
dumb kitchen worker murdering innocent little cockroaches and praised for that 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 note that was that was uh, Don Marquis by the way and that was from Archie and Mahitabal really not Archie and Mahitabal more like Archie Mahitabal is a second rate character compared to Archie and I might oh yeah uh, very much so and I might as well tell you tonight's program is in the epitome of bad taste it's about cockroaches real live walking around you know hardly hardly anything is ever said about cockroaches and and Don Marquis's selection of his character speaking about the world uh, and and incidentally this is some of the most literate stuff that ever appeared in an American newspaper the stuff that Don Marquis did these were written as daily columns you know can you imagine something like that as a daily column today in a newspaper I mean just a daily column forget it that ain't Earl Wilson I'll tell you not by a long shot and and there, there is nothing in our newspapers today well there's a few little things appearing in magazines but nothing in our newspapers today that approach that kind of literacy and vitality that kind of thing and uh I don't know. This is the stuff that people read daily. I mean, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you'd go down two cents. You buy, uh, and in those days, apparently, papers were two cents. And you could go on, you buy this kind of stuff. And you'd read this right next to the stock market report and next to these. In fact, that was on the sport page, by the way. I believe that Marquis did a lot of sports work. No, I, I don't think that was. No, I come to think of it, this was editorial page uh, from the reading that I've read about the work that he did. But on the same paper on the same sport page would be Ring Lardner writing stuff like uh, Alibi Ike, you know, as a daily workout. And a couple of miles away was Mencken writing daily stuff. Now, his selection of the cockroach for... That reminds me, speaking of cockroaches, uh, this is uh, WOR AM at FM New York. Is that a little too early now? Oh, it's, I think, a couple of minutes here now. WOR AM at FM New York. <laughs> Has it occurred to you that the sponsor is the barnacle of the radio world? Now, just the thought. <laughs> I mean, clinging to the ship <laughs> and occasionally dragging it down uh, and occasionally becoming the ship. Uh, but we have we have a sponsor here tonight, which uh, I find considerable pleasure in, and this is the Rover 2000. Uh, these are the people that make the Land Rover, which is a spectacular, is successful mover of rhinoceri and one thing and another all over the world and the rover 2000 is being seen at least by me increasingly more on the highways every day you know it's a funny thing i saw one the other night uh, people people are are uh, a curious kind of uh, kind of attraction to this thing when they see it on the street because it is an unusual looking car and the other night on sixth avenue where there's thousands of cars all parked in a line I saw a group of guys standing around looking at a brand new rover in front of one of the Smilers down downtown. And they're all standing around looking, and here's this beautiful new rover. It was, it was the Oxford Gray, and it had the dark red upholstery, you know, just sitting there in the light of the neon flickering off and on. And it had the steel wheels, and you could see that beautiful polished, uh, that beautiful polished teak steering wheel in there. And these guys were all walking around looking at this thing, sort of with their mouths hanging open. And one guy kept saying, what is that? I don't, know. I don't see no... Uh, see, they don't write all over the side and the front and the top of this car what it is. You know, the way most American cars have a big sign that lights up a neon, whoopee mobile, you know. And it lights up on the side with a neon little sign that comes up out of the top that says what it is. But that's not true of the Rover. Uh, the Rover's identification is in, is in its design and its shape itself. You don't have to have uh, signs all over it. In fact, if you notice that as the American cars look more and more alike, the signs saying which ones they are get bigger and bigger because <laughs> they have to. The, the cars really all look pretty much alike, basically. And the Rover has a distinctive shape, and these guys were all looking at this thing. And I joined the crowd, and I said, it's a new Rover. And the guy said, oh, yeah, I heard of them. Wow. I heard of them. They use them in the belt, don't they, in Africa. And here's this delicate, beautiful looking eye. says, yes, they do. <laughs> Gee. But uh, this is the magnificent Rover 2000 TC. And I suggest, if you'd like to see pictures of it, if you've never seen one, drop a note to Rover here at WOR, and we will send you the specs, technical data, and pictures in color of the Rover 2000 TC, which is the new one. Okay, back to the world of reality, all right? Uh, speaking of cockroach, 
Somebody sent me a clipping. Now, now this is a series. Uh, really, I'm I'm very interested in this thing because because I grew up with cockroaches, and uh, I feel a certain kinship to the cockroach. Now, I'm I'm quite convinced that there's large numbers of people out there who right now are going e ugh ooh, who never lived in a house that was overrun with roaches, who never really had any involvement with cockroaches, and to whom the cockroach is a totally uh, abstract concept. The cockroach is something that they've heard about. <laughs> and once in a while, once in a great while, they'll see one scurrying up the wall of a restaurant. And that's about the end of it. That's a cockroach. But do you know anything about cockroaches? Well, you're going to find out a hell of a lot more than what you know about cockroaches. If you know, if you listen, stay, stay tuned here. If, if, if you are a cockroach fighter, you will be fascinated. That, you know, there's an old Clausewitz uh, uh, theses, uh, Clausewitz, the great tactician, the great Prussian army uh, tactician. He was kind of sort of the Shakespeare of all uh, army uh, uh, of, of maneuver and, and, and tactics and military philosophy. Clausewitz is one of his basic philosophy was know your enemy, find out as much as you can about him, find out what, what kind of a person he is, everything, everything you know about the enemy, and then try to think like that enemy, see. That's, that's one of the basic uh, tactics. Now, I'm giving you a reason for listening to cockroaches. If you hate cockroaches, you see, if you listen to this cockroach show, you're going to learn something about them. Somebody sent me a clipping from, I believe it is, uh, gee, what magazine is this? Uh, it looks like the Reader's Digest. I don't know. Just a little, yeah, I, yeah, I think it is. It's a Reader's Digest, I believe. And it's, a, it's an article by somebody named Ratcliffe. And it was condensed from another paper called the McDonald Farm Journal, which is an official farm journal. So they would be interested in a thing like this. And it's called The Triumph of Archie the Cockroach. And it is about cockroaches. Would you give me a little setting up uh, the theme music there just a little bit now? Because it is a romance. It is a peculiar romance in a way. Listen to this. Dozens of times you have seen him and probably not realized that he is a creature far more remarkable than anything in any zoo anywhere in the world. He is one of the Earth's absolutely oldest inhabitants and possibly even the oldest. And a long pageant of life has passed before his tiny, sharp, beady eyes. He has seen it all. Yes, the cockroach was present. He was on hand, already full-blown and in business, exactly the way he stands today. He was on present to greet the arrival of the dinosaurs 170 million years ago. And he stood by to bid them farewell a hundred million years later when they left the sea. He saw the Rockies, the Alps, the Appalachians push their way upward. He applauded as they reached for the skies. He traveled the land bridge that several times connected the British Isles with the continent. He walked all the way across the channel. He was already a veteran old-timer when Texas oil and West Virginia coal were being made. He's been around. Yes, express his 350 million, 350 million year tenure on Earth in terms of a calendar year. The year was nearly over, December the 30th, when he welcomed that very late arrival, people. It was already December in his year when we showed up. The lowly, ancient, venerable cockroach. Yeah? Do you want to hear more about this? Do you, no, seriously, do you want to know how they live? They're unbelievable characters. At a time when our very survival on Earth is in jeopardy, we might do well to observe Archie, so indelibly christened by Don Marquis, in Archie and Mahitable, the cockroach has learned far more about survival than any other creature on the face of the globe. A living fossil, he has some fantastic attributes. And the most important, he lives anywhere. From the middle of the Sahara to kitchens in Labrador. Cockroaches have been found comfortably ensconced in cash registers. 
in market scales and have lately made a very good and a highly, <laughs> highly developed new home in TV sets where the parts provide warmth plus wax and paraffin, which they eat and enjoy very much. An acceptable, if not epicurean diet for a more lowly breed of cockroach. You know, he just likes condensers, that's all. <laughs> I see what I mean? They can eat anything. That's, uh, anything that we produce, he can eat, eat, eat. eat. And uh, you haven't heard, but less than 1% of the 3,500 known species prefer the home of man to other environments. They live everywhere. Some live in the burrows of ground squirrels, eating stored foods that the squirrels pack away. Others prefer the forest. A large part of Archie's ability to survive undoubtedly traces to the complete catholicity, or catholicity, that's it, catholicity of his tastes. He has been known to eat everything from orchid buds to shoes to the glue that holds cartons together. He sips beer, chews gravy spots off neckties, nibbles at paint. He loves soap. Did you know that cockroaches, whenever you start washing up the joint, this is the last thing that you should do. He loves it. He hangs around. The more soap you slash down the hole, the more he's at this fantastic party. You know, he loves that soap. Yeah, you know, there's a th there's an idea that if you clean things up, they go. Uh-uh. No, no, no. They, they, they like that soap. He even eats his own, if, if necessary, he eats his own cast-off skin. Well, this, this is a guy that knows how to survive. And if hard-pressed, he lives on the eggs of his own species. Like his cousin, the termite, one species of cockroach has enzymes in his, digestri his digestive tract which convert complete wood into utilizable nutrients. Do you realize what a fantastic ability that would be? I mean, to be able just to eat wood, live off wood, you know, it means he can... Uh, he survives periods of starvation that few other creatures could even remotely tolerate. Without visible ill effects, he can live roughly a month without food and water completely. Two months on water alone, five months on dry food, like wood, but no water. Now, we think of cockroaches as filthy because of their odor. You know, the peculiar... If you ever smell cockroaches, that strange odor? Well, that odor is part of how he makes the scene. That odor uh, has... He's got glands, much like those of the skunk. This is another one of Archie's protections. Because of his aroma, many potential predators refuse to eat him. But actually, he is a fantastically fastidious creature. Are you aware of that? He spends hours washing his feet, his legs... Keeping his antenna polished. <laughs> He's got, you know, you've seen that antenna. A little fop. Although known to carry pathogens of polio, typhoid, gastroenteritis, and other diseases, he has yet to be securely linked with spreading any of them. Just carries them around, you know. In the sense that mosquitoes spread malaria, flies, intestinal diseases, and lice, and so on. Uh, get a good close-up. Blatidae. Blatidae. That's Archie's family name. Some forest-dwelling tropical species of the cockroach are nearly as large as hummingbirds. Two and a half inch bodies, seven inch wingspans. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you a little scene what happened to me one night. A little thing that happened. Talking about giant cockroaches. Now, you've probably seen so once in a while one of these really big cockroaches that you will see... Uh, you see them quite often in the city here, down around 14th Street and 20th Street, when it gets hot, and uh, they'll come up out of the sewer or something. You see the great big cockroach, maybe it'll be about an inch long. You, you've seen those big babies. Yeah, have you ever seen them at all, Larry? You never have? Well, you're <laughs> you've got a lot to learn. You see one of these things. One night, I am in, let me tell you a little thing. My, me and Gasser, Gasser and I, uh, we're in the Army, see? And we are assigned... To this this uh, billet, like a barracks, we were assigned to, and it was right on the edge of the Everglades. Hot, steamy. Oh boy, the sun was beating down night after night, and and we we were, we came in a truck, these big uh, troop carrying trucks. You know, Gasser and myself and a couple of other GIs sitting in the back with our barracks bags, and we were being shipped from one point to the next, and we went into this room, the two of us. It had an overhead uh, double double bunk, you know, uh, bunk uh, uh, stack bunks, one on top of the other. And so I threw my, my bag up on, t on the top bunk because Gasser was six and a half feet tall. It was easier for me to be out of top. So I threw my bag on the top. He threw his on the bottom. 
and it's already getting a little dark. And so we went out, we had something to eat, and we came back. And uh, there it was. Now it's time to go to sleep. And we were in this room. It was the first night in the room. We could we could hear the we could hear the insects out. We were right in the middle of the Everglades. Actually, we were on the edge of the of the really big woods, and we could hear the mosquitoes. And we could hear the insects, and we could hear the water outside. You know that the sound of that 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 low swampy water once in a while uh, rippling up against the docks and stuff. And so we're we're lying there in our bunks, and we're talking quietly. And all of a sudden. We became conscious of a sound, but not not really a sound. You couldn't define it; just kind of a sound, just kind of a rushing sound, really. It would, and it would it would start and stop. We'd go like that, start and stop. So Gas says, "What the what the hell is that?" I said, "I don't know. Shh, shh, just a minute." And below me in the bunk underneath gets up, but it's a snake. I said, "Wait, shh, shh." shh. And I had in my barracks bag, I had a flashlight. So I carefully opened the top of my barracks bag, and I reached in, and I pulled out my flashlight. I says, "Okay, gas, so you watch now. I'll turn on the light, and you watch. It sounds like it's coming from over by the wall." He says, shh, "Shh, wait a minute. We can hear that little rushing sound." And Dennis says, "Okay, here goes. Pow! On goes this light." And I had the big three. Three cell flashlight. It goes boom. The light flashes down, and it made a big circle on the floor and up against the side of the wall. And there, right in the middle, right in the middle of that circle, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Gasser hurls an oath like you never heard in your life. Just a, a single four-letter oath, you know. <laughs> and there, up against the wall, were three of them, and they turned around and looked. Uh, so help me, when I when I tell you this, when, when when I read that thing about the two and a half inch size, the tropical types, these were at least that long. I have never seen anything like it. Gigantic things. They looked like mice. At first, I thought they were. You know, I I couldn't believe it. Here were these three enormous cockroaches looking at us, and they were caught in this light. Uh, three of them. They just sat there for a second, like, and all of a sudden, they're gone. And you could hear them go, blah, 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 blah. and they're in the darkness. I'm flashing around. Guess what? Holy smokes! He's <laughs> jumping up, and we, we, I'm flashing the light around, and I see. I couldn't believe it. You talk about the horror. I see the room is alive with them. These babies are all around. I flash. They're all around the, the the molding of the floor, and I flash. I could see them on the ceiling. There must have been five thousand cockroaches. The combined weight of which were probably a quarter of a ton. I never saw anything like it. Well, well, that all that night we, we hunted cockroaches. They were sharp. Oh, were they fast? They were. They were like lightning. I'll tell you, they were like a shadow. Uh, as long as you held the light on them for a second, they would sit there. They would. They wouldn't move. But the instant you moved, or in any way, shape, or form, gave them any idea that you were about to, to start a scene, they were like a shadow. They just go, and they're gone. Never saw anything like it. Well, for one week we stayed in that room. <laughs> I'll tell you, for one solid week, it was total hell every night. Gasser and Shepard fighting the cockroaches. And we never got one. You know, we, we would almost get one. We never really quite got one. Once in a while, you know, you'd bang around, you'd jump on gas, or would jump around, he hit with his shoe and yell and holler. Well, well, about after the third night, I remember talking to the first sergeant of the company. He says, we're sitting in the, in the chow hall. I says, these cockroaches are fantastic. He says, ah, you don't see him after a while. I said, well, gee, why don't you do something? He said, what do you mean do? He said, we, 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 for, for a year, we tried everything. This guy was a uh, cadre here. You know, he was always there. He says, we sprayed we're, we're, everything but burned down the barracks. You can't get rid of them. He says, ah, you know, you just live with them now. Now, that's what is known as the survival of the cockroach. You just live with them. That's the end of it. You, I mean, ultimately. Do you want to hear more about these things? They're fantastic. These are two-and-a-half-inch bodies. So it's the tropical types. Yeah, that's the kind I saw. Two and a half inch bodies, seven inch wingspans. Let me tell you the night I saw one fly through the barracks. Now, I'll give you another story about that. Have you ever seen flying cockroaches that take off? Well, all right. All right. Here I am, another scene. The same, same area, only about 30 miles inland from there. That is in towards the center of the swamp. Well, I'm lying under... Uh, in this in this pyramidal tent, 
And there's there's eight of us on this pyramidal tent. So we've got our bunks all out there with a the mosquito bar and all that. We're all lights out. I'm asleep, half drowsing away, and it's pitch black in the darkness there. And every night before we would go to sleep, the CQ would come around. And the CQ, in case you don't know what this is, a charge of quarters. This is usually a, a corporal uh, who is he's up all night. That's it. And he just sit, sits around. And, and when a guy comes in off pass, he checks him in. And occasionally he walks around, sees everything is okay, cool. And, well, you know, that's it. He's charge of quarters. He's, a, he's the janitor, the night janitor. So every night uh, before we, would, when we were in, in our mosquito nets, we'd pull the mosquito bars over us, the mosquito nets. And he would come around. Uh, and at, into every tent, and he has this gigantic spray gun, a great big baby that had about a gallon container on the bottom. And he would come in, and he would spray each one of our mosquito bars after we were in, from the outside, see. He would spray each one of us to keep whatever was out there from getting in. And whatever was out there was, uh, Lord only knows what. I mean, it was everything out there. And so he would spray this, he would spray this place, and we'd be lying there. So now he's around, he sprays the, he sprays the mosquito bar this night. This is one of those little instant, uh, little moments in the Army, I remember vividly. And I'm, I'm, I'm under my mosquito bar, and it's just about the time when I'm just beginning to doze off, and a couple of guys are talking quietly over in the dark there, and, and uh, it's pitch black in the place. Totally silent. Well, there's nothing as silent as a swamp when, when it's uh, close to midnight. It really is silent. And uh, there's a big moon hanging out there somewhere. You can see it just drifting in through the tent door. And off in the distance, you can hear the sound of our radar set pulsating in the night. You can hear the the, uh, keying circuit, that 440-cycle hum, which was so much part of our lives. By the way, they found out that that hum, in case you're interested, which was a 440-cycle hum, attracted mosquitoes. It attracted them. Yeah, it did. For a long time, they couldn't figure why, no matter where we went, <laughs> mosquitoes were more than they'd ever been before. And everyone thought maybe it was the kind of clothing we wore or something. And it turns out that the, that the radar set itself had a certain hum, and there was something about the RF that it uh, transmitted uh, that drew mosquitoes from millions of miles around. Apparently, they were hung on, on the RF current or something. They got, got the monkey on their back or something. And so uh, you could hear this thing, and we're lying in bed, and it's about uh, quarter to twelve, just about the time of beginning to drift off, when all of a sudden there was this funny sound in the tent. You could hear it coming from the door, and it went right through the tent and made a circle and, ran, and, and flew right between all the, all the bunks. It, was a sound, it sounded exactly like, have you ever heard a model airplane, the kind that's the rubber band kind that you wind up, and when you let go of the prop, it goes... It makes a sound, just, you heard this sound. Well, this thing went, it's flying through the barracks. And somebody says, who the hell's playing with a model airplane? And it goes, and so I said, what's that? Hey, come on, quit that with a, who's fooling around a model airplane? Everybody's awake instantly like that. And somebody hollers, hi, CQ! <laughs> you hear the airplane flying up. Hey, CQ! Somebody's yelling it out. Hey! And you hear the guy, he's run, he runs along the duckboards outside. And he opens the tent. He says, what's going on? What's the matter? And he's got the flashlight. That's why they were yelling for him. He turns on the light and he flashes it in. And there in the beam is one of these babies flying. It was the first time I ever saw one fly. And so help me, he looked, oh really, he looked like a P-51, a miniature P-51. His wings are flapping. He's going... He's just cruising around about eight feet off the ground, you know... <laughs> and he's hanging in the beam. It looked like a tiny, a tiny bomber caught in the in the anti-aircraft beams. You know, so, there's another one. Get him! It's the enemy. You know, <laughs> it's air raid. And, and uh, that was that was one of those one of those moments with the flying cockroach. I never saw anything in my life like that. And it was it was huge. When he was flying, he had about a seven inch wingspan, as they say. That is an awful big wingspan. Measure it. And and by the way, do you want to hear more about this now? Seven inch. Uh, some of them, others are tinier than grains of rice. They have all different sizes. The color is usually in the brown to black range, although some look like rainbows. Nearly all of them have wings. You know that even the household species can fly if he wants to. You never see him fly, do you, the kind of They can fly if all other means of escape fail. Now, that's what I mean by survival. This guy is, is amphibious. He can fly. He can do anything. It says, their main reliance is placed on six long, powerful, very fast feet. 
They are among the fastest of the of the of the insect world. The cockroach's two antennae are his most remarkable equipment. They're longer than the cockroach himself. They help him feel his way in the dark. They contain olfactory cells. They smell with them. They detect food and water and apparently pick up sound waves with the antenna and possibly even rock and roll. They do not know what else he picks up with this antenna. The antenna, by the way, also plays a key role in reproduction. That that when a cockroach is out looking to make the scene, he waves them antenna in the air. And when he sees another pair of antenna waving in the air, he knows that there's action. (laughs) In case you're interested, his nocturnal habits have helped ensure his place on Earth. In the sanctuary of darkness, he avoids many potential enemies. He has two superbly sensitive compound eyes. Now, that's something you see. The, the eyes, have you ever wondered whether, uh, whether an insect can see well? Well, this guy has superbly sensitive eyes, and he has three simple eyes on top of his head. Now, he's got, that gives him five eyes. Two really superb, sensitive ones, and then three simple eyes that go up on little stalks. You can look around. So, <laughs> so you know, he's really ready. Even when he's blinded, you see, he can shut two or three of them off, and one or two of his eyes will always work. And even when blind, he recognizes light as danger and will scurry for cover when the kitchen light is switched on, even when he's blinded. Uh, He is far tougher than the 35-ton dinosaurs he once rubbed elbows with. Step on a cockroach, and his hard, compressible body almost always saves him. Have you ever stepped on a cockroach, and then he gets up and runs away again? (laughs) <laughs> you know, he's, try stepping on a, on, a, on a dinosaur. He skitters away when pressure is removed. A contortionist, he can get through cracks that appear impossible to negotiate. Freeze a cockroach, totally hard. And leave him sit there for a month, thaw him out, and he walks away, sniffing. <laughs> now, really, that's a fantastic creature. He is also prolific, by the way. 24 hours after reaching adulthood, he starts in business. Or a she. Female produce as many as 180 offspring in 303 days. The babies grow up in a month, and then they start in business and grow about a year. Given favorable circumstances, the population leaps ahead in fantastic spurts. Russian scientists collected 475,000 dead cockroaches from a single army barracks. (laughs) That sounds familiar, doesn't it? The female is generally a good mother. Some species hatch eggs within their bodies to produce live young, but most species carry 12 to 40 eggs in nice little purse-shaped sacs protruding from the end of the abdomen. As with other females, they occasionally mislay their purse. The eggs will hatch, however, anyway. The newborn able to survive for up to a month without food. They are inveterate travelers, and this is another thing that kept, that's kept them going. European cockroaches arrived in America aboard the Mayflower. They say that the first one came over here. And now they are headed for space. They figure that already cockroaches have stowed aboard that little thing that's up on the moon. Hey, by the way, speaking of the surveyor that's up on the moon, uh, 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 that's a remarkably uh, uh, human piece of equipment, isn't it? This thing could do almost anything. You know, now they're going to make it so it shoots little things at its feet. And you know, Did you read about that? They're going to make it do that. And, and did you read that one sad little note about it? One no, strange little human-type note. They were about to send this thing up. You know, they, they made it in this laboratory, and it's standing there, this surveyor. And uh, they're looking at it. And all of a sudden, one of the scientists said, we forgot something. And somebody says, what do you mean we forgot something? Here's this thing that's got little mirrors, and it's got color things, and it's got little things to shoot at its feet and everything. And he says, we forgot something. And the second guy says, what did we forget? He says, a flag. There is no flag on it. So they, they had to ship the thing. It was going to go. It was going to go in about 20 minutes, and there was no place to get a flag. So this guy rushed out, and he ran around in the streets to look for a flag, and he wound up at a discount house. <laughs> a discount place where they're selling, you know, uh, uh, imitation uh, ivory toothpicks. You've been in those joints. You know, they got all the little crummy junk. And he's looking around, and he comes rushing, and he says, I want a flag. And the only flag they could find was a 23-cent flag, a discount flag that was made in Japan. 
Oh boy, if that isn't if that isn't typical of American patriotism today, believe me, if the Russians were sending one up, they would have already had a hand woven flag made by the Tsar himself if they could find still a live Tsar, you know. <laughs> they would. Americans don't think of this. So they run around and they they stick this little flag in. And they, they, they couldn't figure out where to put it. So he's got these legs that are made out of tubes, you know. So they stuck in one of the tubes. There is now, up on the moon, a discount 23-cent American flag. It's stuck in, in, in this little tube up there. And it was made in Japan. And they, they, they're beginning to figure now that possibly, conceivably, a few cockroaches might have made the scene on... <laughs> On, on this surveyor already there's probably somebody up on the moon said what the devil is this now what are these things and the first cockroaches are already learning how to digest moon dust they're in business but by the way they 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 are sending some of them a capsule has been prepared for a cockroach's first official journey into space a beer can they're putting them in a beer can it will it contains all air he will need for weeks there's no necessity to provide food and water they're going to send him up to Mars or someplace. Electrodes have been devised to check his nervous and his muscular responses and will be radioed back to Earth. And uh, he may even have a few things to say about the landscape. All of this will yield valuable information translatable to men. In other words, if they let him out and he's on Mars, he's like, oh, my God, oh, wow, is this hot? Oh, wow. Instantly, they will get the message back that his nervous system is hot. You know, it's, it's hot or it's cold or whatever it is. Because of hardiness and rapid breeding, they figure that if he's up there long enough, he may well establish a pretty interesting colony. So this, this, uh, there, there's a lot more about it. However, the, the one final line, it says that, that uh, some insects are noted for what they teach man. Ants supposedly teach thrift and planning. You know, they talk about the ants, the bees, the virtues of industry, grasshoppers, supposedly the virtues of the pure joy of living. What about a cockroach? They have taught man nothing except survival. The one thing that the cockroach knows how to do is hang in there, baby. The cockroach makes the scene and will continue to make the scene forever and ever. You know, I, I meant to tell, I meant to tell a story tonight, but I got involved in this this uh, technical description of the cockroach. By the way, this was all from an article in the Reader's Digest. Apparently, that's uh, some guy sent it to me by a man named Ratcliffe. But I, I have personally uh, had, I was going to tell the story about, maybe, maybe I'll save it for the limelight. Do you think I'll save it for the limelight? I, I don't know whether that's a good story to tell in the limelight about me and Doppler and Schwartz catching the cockroaches and uh, using electrolysis to destroy them. We found that this was a way. Oh, yeah, we, we, used to, we used to hunt cockroaches like Hemingway hunted lions, you know, really. And uh, I think maybe I, I possibly may just save that story. But I meant to tell it. And how we got so the night, I'll never forget the night that I brought the ball jar back. After a fantastic evening catching cockroaches, you know one of the. Are you aware that one place that the cockroaches love to live, and I found this as an old cockroach hunter, you wouldn't believe it. They love to live in electric clocks. You know why? The electric clock has a little coil in, it, and it radiates heat. And also in an electric clock, there are large deposits of grease and oil. You know the thing has been oiled at the factory. It's warm. It's also very dark. And there are usually cracks in the back. You can get into it, you know, that little cardboard back of the darn thing. If, if you want to find one place where cockroaches make the scene really big, it's 